Good morning and welcome to our Thursday, December 10th uh, COVID-19 briefing. Today I have with me Bryn Kerrigan, the Assistant Director of Kern Public Health, our Chief Administrative Officer, Ryan Alsop, the CEO of Kern Medical, Russell Judd, and our lead epidemiologist, Kim Hernandez. First, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Bryn Kerrigan. Good morning. Today, we're announcing 990 new cases, bringing Kern County's total resident cases to 48,401, um, and no new deaths this morning. Over this past week, there have been 42 new positive staff within 12 of our skilled nursing facilities and 56 new positive residents within seven of our skilled nursing facilities with 23 of those new positive residents from yesterday within a single skilled nursing facility. Additionally, our prisons are experiencing significant increases in cases. Our five state prisons saw an increase of 206 cases in inmates just yesterday. However, these congregate settings are frankly not the only contributor to the increase in cases we're seeing here locally. These steep increases in cases that we've been experiencing require all of us to pause and make sure we as individuals are being as responsible as possible to help slow the spread of this disease and to decrease the burden on our healthcare system. We need to ensure we are all doing our part by wearing a mask when we are outside our houses, avoiding gatherings when at all possible, practicing physical distancing when in the presence of people outside our household and washing our hands. As of Tuesday, December 8th, the state released our monitoring metrics. Our testing rate was 283.4, um, and the state's uh, median testing rate increased significantly to 362, which as you know, impacts our case rate. Our unadjusted case rate is at 37, when last week it was at 36.6. Um, and, but because of that testing rate um, adjustment, our adjusted case rate is announced at 40.3. Our testing positivity rate is at 15.3% countywide, and within that lowest quartile, it's at 19.7%. On September 30th, 2020, the state announced a health equity measure as a component of the blueprint for a safer economy, which became effective October 6th. This metric requires counties to implement more intensive efforts to prevent and mitigate the spread of COVID-19 for areas that have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. These areas were identified by the state as the lowest quartile of the Healthy Places Index. What this means is that counties' census tracts have been ranked using the California Healthy Places Index based on socioeconomic conditions like education and access to health care. Kern County Public Health Services has implemented multiple strategies to address these areas that I'd like to share with you. First, we began using a reverse 911 system where we recorded a message about free testing availability that's transmitted through a phone call, text message, or email, whichever method is selected by each resident. Ready Kern messages have been sent out in 24 of the 35 census tracts, including Arvin, Wasco, Delano, McFarland, Shafter, Lamont, Oildale, and Bakersfield, reaching over 67,323 residents. We also sent out a mass mailing. Um, this went out to 56,000 residences within the 35 census tracts with general COVID and testing information, as well as information related to the Housing for Harvest program. Uh, 12,000 gift cards were purchased with CARES Act funding to be distributed to individuals who obtain a test at a testing site within um, one of the census tracts located in the lowest quartile. These gift cards were deployed on November 30th, and for last week, 5,208 gift cards were distributed. The Public Health Services Department also staffs a mobile testing site that's deployed six days each week to various locations within the lowest quartile census tracts. These sites are identified, scheduled, and marketed in coordination with the Latino Task Force. Today, our team is providing free testing in Ridgecrest at Leroy Jackson Park. Gift cards are available at this site as well. We've also deployed two teams of 10 individuals for door-to-door -door canvassing or outreach within 35 census tracts. Our canvassers have visited more than nine of the 35 census tracts, speaking with individuals at over 1,500 houses. A majority of the individuals our canvassers speak with are appreciative of the information we are providing them. 
Our, potential uh, our canvassers are also gaining a better understanding of potential barriers to obtaining testing, which we are addressing with our testing sites. We leave behind PPE, including masks and hand sanitizer, and, our bro and brochures related to available um, isolation and quarantine assistance programs. Our canvassers are in Lamont today. Last week, the department submitted a draft COVID-19 vaccination plan to the California Department for Public, of Public Health for input. Once we receive feedback from the state on our plan, we will obtain stakeholder input to finalize that plan. As the governor announced in his press conference earlier this week, we do anticipate the first shipment of vaccines to arrive as early as this weekend, assuming that FDA authorization of the Pfizer vaccine occurs this week. As the CDC has prioritized, the first allocation of this vaccine, referred to as phase 1A, will be used for high-risk healthcare workers. We do not anticipate that this round of vaccine will be enough to vaccinate all of our hospital healthcare workers. The preliminary allocation of Pfizer vaccine is anticipated to be 5,850 doses. We've been working closely with our hospitals who will distribute this first round of vaccine and who will likely continue vaccinating healthcare workers, even those not employed by the hospitals as more doses are received. Distributed vaccines will be closely monitored. Enrollment in the CDC's vaccination program, which is a requirement to receive vaccine allocation, requires agencies to agree to daily reporting of vaccine. Doses will be reported in the state registry daily. Further vaccine allocation to these sites will be contingent on these agencies fulfilling their daily reporting requirements. We will follow the CDC's prioritization schedule to distribute further shipments of vaccine. We will add additional providers as we work through the prioritization list to ensure that the vaccine is readily available for those prioritized groups. As the vaccine becomes more widely available, we will utilize our traditional communication methods, as well as our canvassing team providing door-to-door -door outreach, the Latino task force, local community leaders, large employers, and faith-based groups to educate the community on the vaccine. Additionally, we are developing a COVID vaccine webpage. On Thursday, December 3rd, Governor Newsom announced a regional stay-at-home order. Rather than implementing this order statewide, this order groups counties into five regions within the state and uses intensive care unit capacity as a metric for implementation. Kern County was placed in the San Joaquin Valley region, along with Calaveras, Fresno, uh, Kings, Madera, Mariposa, Merced, San Benito, San Joaquin, Stanislaus, Tulare, and Tuolumne counties. This regional stay-at-home order went into effect December 5th at 12.59 p.m. and would be implemented within all counties within a region when a regional ICU capacity falls below 15%. Late Friday night, the state reported that the San Joaquin Valley region's ICU capacity was 14.1%, which subsequently fell to 8.6% on Saturday. While this seems like a substantial decrease in capacity, it's important to note that the state changed the calculation um, of available ICU beds during this time period to exclude pediatric ICU beds. On Sunday, the San Joaquin um, region's ICU capacity was 6.6%. Monday, it was 6.3%. Tuesday, it was 5.6%. And yesterday, it was 4.2%. Today, the state will announce the region's ICU capacity at 1.9%. Please note this reported capacity is not the true capacity rate, but capacity adjusted downward based on a standardization factor that I will discuss in a moment. Because of the region's standardized capacity on Saturday, the regional stay-at-home order went into effect in Kern County at 11.59 p.m. on Sunday, December 6th. This regional stay-at-home order will remain in place for a minimum of three weeks and will not be lifted until it is projected that the ICU capacity within the region will be at least 15% for the subsequent four weeks. When the regional stay-at-home order is lifted, each individual county uh, within the region will return to their appropriate blueprint for a safer economy tier. Regional ICU capacity will be, available, will be evaluated on a daily basis by the state and posted on their website at covid19.ca.gov. As of yesterday, three of the five regions within the state are under the regional stay-at-home order. I mentioned the standardization factor related to the state ICU capacity calculation earlier. This is an arbitrary adjustment made to the capacity calculation. 
the state adjusts the available ICU capacity downward by half of a percent for every 1% the occupancy of the ICU exceeds 30% COVID-19 patients. We believe we are able to replicate the state's calculation using data reported from the hospitals. As of today, we estimate that Kern County's ICU capacity is 5.7% based on the standardization factor the state applies for the percentage of COVID-occupied ICU beds. Without the standardization factor, Kern's ICU capacity is 10.6%. Um, just for some more local numbers, as of um, December 8th, we had 829 available hospital um, beds. We had 846 available hospital beds at this time last week. Um, we have 49 available ICU beds, and at this time last week, we had 50 available ICU beds. When you compare COVID hospitalizations, today we have 225 COVID hospitalized patients, whereas this time last week, we had 187. Um, today, we have 54 COVID-positive ICU hospitalized patients, and at this time last week, we had 41. Kern's hospital capacity fluctuates every day. However, overall, the stats illustrate our capacity is decreasing. Kern has been preparing for these hospital surges since the beginning of the pandemic. The Kern County Board of Supervisors devoted CARES Act funding to provide ICU nurse, nurse staffing to Kern hospitals. As of last week, 28 additional ICU nurses have been added to Kern's hospital system. Furthermore, the county has been maintaining the alternative care site known as the ACS, keeping it in warm status and ready to accept patients with a 48 to 72 hour notice. I will now invite Russell Judd, the CEO of Kern Medical, to expand on the preparedness of our local hospitals. Uh, good morning. Uh, <clears throat> I echo first and foremost uh, the comments that Bryn made that we encourage our citizens, and our community members, our friends and our family members to be very careful, to wear your mask, to be socially distanced, to avoid gatherings outside of those very few people uh, that you live with. Uh, this disease is spread in families as one person goes out uh, and is exposed. As Bryn mentioned, the hospitals have been preparing very diligently uh, over the, from the beginning of this pandemic, uh, now over 10 months ago, uh, for this exact situation. Uh, yes, we see that the number of hospitalized patients is increasing. Uh, the narrowest neck of the funnel is the ICU and an element that we are extremely aware of and concerned about. Uh, but I will reemphasize that uh, we are prepared uh, and are moving forward uh, with those plans to be able to meet our community's needs. Uh, note also that ICU capacity is not just based upon COVID patients. Uh, ICU also serves to care for the very sickest that happen just because of life. At Kern Medical, uh, as of today, our ICU is full. However, we only have one COVID positive patient. Uh, the remainder of those patients are uh, trauma victims and other individuals who are ill and not related uh, to COVID. Uh, there is still, as Bryn mentioned, capacity for additional care to provide it in the intensive care units as well as uh, in other hospital uh, facilities. Now is not the time where we're at crisis. Uh, however, we do continue to encourage individuals to be safe uh, to avoid the spread of the disease so we do not get to that uh, crisis point. Uh, the hospitals are working together. Uh, we continue to meet uh, across all 10 hospitals uh, in Kern County on a regular basis. There's active communication about how we share resources, about how the best patient care is provided. Uh, we are united uh, together uh, across all 10 hospitals to uh, meet this challenge and to provide the very best care that we can uh, to our community. Uh, we're also, as Bryn mentioned, preparing to receive the vaccine. Uh, plans are being uh, laid uh, for us to be able to vaccinate uh, the healthcare workers. Uh, and then once uh, we get through that phase 1A, uh, we are united uh, and we will be prepared to help the community in any way that is necessary. Uh, to uh, vaccinate others, and then eventually as we, that is made available to the general population. The vaccine has proven to be effective. The science behind it is sound, uh, and we encourage all 
uh, to take the vaccine, to trust it, uh, to know that uh, immunity is what keeps, stops the spread of this disease. We will get back to normal uh, as we embrace the vaccine uh, and allow it uh, to do what it needs to do, and that is keeping each other safe. Again, the hospitals are prepared. We have very dynamic surge plans. Uh, we handle a fluctuation of patients on a daily basis. Uh, you could have pointed to a random day in December, uh, any time over the last couple of years, and found us in this exact same hospitalization state as far as it being full. It could have been a different disease. It could have been the flu. Uh, we handle this fluctuation of patients. Uh, we can handle where we are now. Uh, but again, uh, concerned about what may be around the corner and encouraging everyone to be safe. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Uh, before we start taking questions from the media outlets that are on the line, I just want to remind everybody watching that if you are looking for a testing location, you can find those uh, at the Kern Public Health website as well as kerncounty.com. There's a button on the very front uh, that will link to an interactive map where you can enter your address uh, if you're on a desktop version and it will give you the closest location to you as well as all the information pertinent to that site. Okay, so I'm going to go down the list as it was sent to all of our outlets. First up is channel 29. I believe we have Aaron on the line. Hi, uh, thank you so much. So my first question is about, you guys mentioned the CDC allocation plan for getting the first round of healthcare workers vaccinated. I was just wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail about that. Um, what will be the plan of action? How should healthcare workers get signed up for this? Will it all be done through the hospitals? If you guys could give a little bit more detail about that. Okay, so you're looking for a plan on how phase 1A of the vaccine will be deployed, correct? Correct. Okay, uh, we're going to have our lead epidemiologist, Kim Hernandez, respond to your question. Thank you. Good morning. Um, as you know, the FDA is scheduled to review and make a determination um, on the Pfizer and BioNTech um, vaccine today, and that there are um, uh, going to be reviewing um, other vaccines in the near future. Uh, in Kern County, we have been working closely with our community hospitals um, because this will be our first allocation um, is intended to go to um, healthcare workers at the highest risk of exposure to COVID-19 in our general acute care facilities in Kern County. Um, from there, through the state's prioritization method, um, we're working our way through the various organizations in tier one to contact um, those uh, healthcare facilities um, to make preparations to vaccinate their staff. Um, the state has developed sort of a, a tiered approach to expand these circles of healthcare providers um, based on those at highest risk um, so that we can get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. We at Public Health um, are working with all of these different community members. Um, everybody who is going to provide vaccinations, do, uh, they do have to register with the CDC's COVID-19 vaccination program. Um, and so they also have to register with the state. Um, there are a number of parameters involved. We're working with all of the providers that have reached out to us um, to vaccinate their staff. Um, and this will be kind of rolled out in a phased approach as more vaccine becomes available in Kern County. Thank you. Our next outlet is Channel 17. I believe we have Aton on the line. Yes, good morning, everybody. Hi, Megan. Uh, I, I may have some follow-up questions later for, for Mr. Judd if we have time, but I first just want to get to uh, Ms. Kerrigan, if possible, just if it's okay with you, if you can go over one more time uh, the you, you mentioned the, uh, uh, the standardization factor. Are you able to explain the, uh, the kind of um, the, math, the math that goes into that one more time about standardization and why Kern's, why the ITU is lower based on when you factor in standardization than, than it actually is? Thank you so much. Yeah, Aton, let me just make sure I understand what you're asking of Ms. Kerrigan. Do you just want her to go back through what she shared previously so you have the information, or are you needing her to go in more depth onto a particular part of that? 
Well, I would be, I, I'll be grateful if she could go back and just review what she had asked about that. But I mean, sorry, what she had stated about that. But anything uh, more in depth would be, would be appreciated as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Good morning. So the standardization factor is a, an arbitrary adjustment that's made to the available ICU capacity within counties and within regions. And the way that that standardization factor is applied is that the state adjusts that um, available capacity down by half of a percent for every 1% that the, uh, the occupancy of an ICU exceeds 30% COVID positive patients. So if you have 31% COVID positive patient occupancy within your ICU, the, um, uh, the available ICU capacity is adjusted downward by half of a percent. All righty, thank you. Thanks, Bryn. Uh, our next outlet is KUZZ. I believe we have Rob on the line. Hi, Megan, it's Rob, how you doing? Doing well. Um, I, my question is, we've been hearing some rumblings about some businesses just kind of not choosing to follow a stay-at-home order and recommended closures. Uh, so our question is, what role does the county play in, um, I guess, the restrictions? Do you guys inform the state? Do you uh, ignore it? Like, what, what role do you guys play? Okay, thanks for the question. Uh, we're going to have Ryan Alsop respond. Hi. Um, we play the same role that we've played uh, the last nine months, which is a focus on education, on reinforcement of the state orders, uh, making sure that our business community understands what those state orders are, um, uh, the different directives of the uh, state public health officials, making ensuring that they have an understanding of what the, uh, the governor's uh, directives and orders around COVID-19 are. Um, we continue to do all the other work uh, that uh, Ms. Kerrigan walked through in detail uh, in her comments earlier, which is a tremendous amount of work. Um, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, I'm not sure how you effectively enforce uh, the variety, the vast variety of, of uh, directives that the state has handed down, whether it's a curfew or a mask mandate or a stay-at-home order or business closures, et cetera, et cetera. There are a slew of, of orders. Um, I'm not sure how you make resource allocation decisions, uh, sending people in to uh, spend time uh, dealing with businesses, uh, when uh, we know that the vast majority of this transmission is taking place in private settings and at home among family members and close friends and networks. Um, this is a uh, situation that is, uh, uh, again, uh, these orders are being handed down by the state. There is no coordination uh, between the state and counties uh, in the development of these orders. Uh, these orders are uh, announced. Uh, typically we find out just hours before they're announced and uh, it's a little frustrating uh, when we're asked these questions when the state uh, should be answering these questions. Uh, these questions should be directed uh, to the state of California and the governor's office. Uh, I know that uh, typically when those questions are posed uh, to the administration, they defer, they simply defer uh, to counties uh, to answer. And so that's a little, little frustrating. Uh, I think you've heard the comments of our, uh, our, our sheriff uh, on how he's managing his agency through this, but uh, uh, we continue to stake out a, pos a strong position of education, of reinforcement of uh, what the state is handing down and what the state has announced. Uh, and uh, we're counting on that and counting on individuals in our community uh, to act accordingly and use good judgment and be smart, be safe, all the things we've been talking about uh, for the last nine months. Okay, thank you. Our next outlet is channel 23. I believe we have Austin on the line.
Yeah, hey guys. I um, I know our local data has shown, uh, like like Mr. Alsop was just talking about, that uh, <clears throat> businesses that have been shut down uh, have not been proven as being one of the major causes of community uh, spread here. The county has said that the most significant contributor is uh, those households, like you mentioned. And so it would seem that there, there could be a question as to why the state has taken some of the steps it's taken to restrict our economy. So my question is, how is the county has the county rather said anything directly to the state about this? Have you guys asked them um, why our local businesses are being restricted or, or what data they're basing their decision on? Thanks. Thanks, Austin. I think Ryan's going to respond first. Yeah, I'll respond and, and maybe Ms. Kerrigan or, or Kim could come up. Uh, but essentially the answer to your question is yes. I mean, all counties are uh, communicating or trying to communicate with uh, the, the state, whether it's officially by county or uh, individual cities, uh, or even folks in the business community themselves and the associations that represent those industries that are in Sacramento, the lobbying arm, whether it's the California Restaurant Association or any number of different associations representative of business placed in Sacramento to advocate on behalf of industry. Uh, the communication is, is happening. Um, I think that, uh, you know, you could look across the state and at, at the, 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 across the 58 counties in this state, and you'll find that uh, there is a fair amount of, of uh, communication happening, uh, whether it's uh, direct pushback on any number uh, of, these, of these orders uh, pertaining to businesses or just uh, simply some, uh, some advice or counsel that's trying to be provided. Uh, by uh, local entities like our county or the business community uh, to have the governor either curtail or change up uh, the orders. Uh, but uh, I, I simply want to say that, uh, you know, without a pathway uh, for uh, various industries to operate uh, in, a, in a real impactful way uh, that, that allows those businesses to survive, that allows those businesses to uh, uh, you know, pay their employees, allow those business owners, particularly small business owners, allows them to pay their bills and to, uh, to maintain their livelihoods uh, to the extent that they uh, can without uh, providing any pathway there. Um, the governor is going to have, and we're all going to have a very, very difficult uh, time uh, uh, having any compliance um, and I think that's what you're seeing. It's not just here in Kern County, but it's all over this entire state in every county in, in almost every single city. Uh, you've got people pushing back and, uh, again, uh, simply trying to survive. They are not being given a pathway uh, to do that, and it's do or die. And uh, that's the, 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 uh, the situation that many of these, uh, these business owners are, are facing. And so they are choosing, in many cases, survival uh, through this. And uh, that would be my answer. And Ms. Kerrigan, do you have anything to add to that? OK, thank you. Thanks. Our next outlet is Valley Public Radio. I believe we have Carrie on the line. Hi there, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask, this is a question for, for anyone really. So, um, so Mr. Judd, when, when he had spoken, you know, he had said, uh, you know, we are not in crisis mode at the moment. Um, you know, that we do have a lot of hospital beds, and we being, you know, across the county, have a lot of hospital beds, some ICU beds open. But I wonder, you know, is that, I mean, is there is there any perspective in which we are in a crisis? Not that I'm trying to create, um, you know, fright around all of this, but I think that there are a lot of other parts of the valley that are saying, you know, really this is getting very bad. Um, you know, do you think that is a message that we should be sharing at this point? Uh, so, Carrie, I'm going to have Russell respond from the hospital perspective, um, and then if we have others that need to respond, we will. So, 
so, <clears throat> excuse me, I think there's kind of two points here. Uh, one is we are very concerned about the spread of this virus. Uh, we know what spreads it. It is close contact. It's people breathing on each other. And so we do need to stress to the community, uh, don't take this lightly. We've been living this for 10 months. Hopefully nobody is, that this is serious. Uh, and we have to make that message. But the other message is that today we are able to handle uh, the number of patients that we are seeing in our facilities. Uh, hospitals uh, have been preparing for this for a long time. We don't have the option of saying, oh, sorry, you're sick, we're full, figure it out on your own, and not to be cavalier by any means. And so we work hard, uh, we have plans, uh, we have plenty of PPE at this time, uh, we can uh, have, loca we have locations identified where we can uh, place patients if it exceeds the, the typical hospital bed. And so it's the message of be very cautious and in your own personal life, make sure you're protecting yourself and your loved ones. Uh, but also to know that we are prepared. Uh, we can handle this. Uh, as I mentioned, and, and I'll repeat it again, that you could have picked a random day in December uh, over the last couple of years and found the number of patients in hospital beds and in ICU beds in the previous December, the same as it is today. And, and I say that, again, not to let people say, oh, we're fine, we can go out and do whatever we want, uh, but to just assure the public that we're here. Uh, again, we're dynamic. Uh, as the trauma center, speaking specifically for Kern Medical, uh, we're prepared for way more than beds that we have because if we have a very mass casualty accident and we have 20 or 30 significantly ill people showing up at one time, we're prepared to care for them. That's what we do. That's how we prepare. Uh, that's how we work. And so people need to be cautious, but there does not to be a panic mentality that we're all overrunning hospitals and there's nowhere for anybody to get care. From a case perspective in Kern County, uh, we're just looking at our dashboard and something that is very shocking when you look at it is on December 3rd, which is still a grayed out area on our dashboard, meaning we're still expecting more test results to come in from that specimen collection date, we have 886 positive results. And that is 10% higher than the highest day in our first surge, which was July 7th at 803. So we are seeing significant transmission of COVID-19 in our community. I just think that that means that we all need to pause for a moment, reflect on the COVID mitigation measure measures we're using in our own lives and strengthen those. Wear a mask when you're outside of the house. Make sure you're not gathering when you don't need to be with people from outside your household. Make sure that when you're with people from outside of your household that you're maintaining that physical distancing and that you're keeping your hands washed at all times so that we can limit this transmission of this disease. Okay, before we go back through the list of outlets, there is one unknown caller. We don't know exactly which outlet you're with. It's a 549 number. So I'm going to pause for a second and give that individual a chance to chime in. Okay, we'll go back up to the top, channel 29. Aaron, did you have any follow-up questions? Hi, um, I just have one more question going back to the vaccine. Um, for those who have already had the virus, no matter if they're a healthcare worker or just someone who's part of the general public, um, is natural in, uh, immunization enough or will they need to get vaccinated or how much of a priority will those people be um, who have had the virus and who are possibly a healthcare worker? Is it still important for them to get vaccinated? Thanks, Erin. We're gonna have Kim Hernandez respond. Thank you. 
Hi, Erin, that's a great question, <clears throat> excuse me, and a very common one. And so currently, CDC does recommend um, the vaccine for all healthcare providers, um, whether or not they have had um, COVID disease in the past, if they've had a previous COVID-19 infection, it is still recommended that they get vaccinated. Um, as you know, we are still continuing to learn more about the potentials for reinfection. Um, and so just like even if you've had COVID-19 in the past, we still recommend you follow all of the interventions um, and all of the modifications to avoid um, future contact with others, um, because we do know that people can be reinfected. It is still believed to be very rare, um, but we have not yet identified, you know, who is at highest risk of being reinfected infected or what circumstances put people at highest risk. And so at this time, we do recommend that people who have been, um, have had a positive COVID test in the past should still get the, get vaccinated. Um, that may change as more information comes out, but currently that's the recommendation today. Awesome. Thank you. Channel 17, Aton, did you have any follow-up questions? Yes, uh, two follow-up questions, Megan, and let me know if you need me to repeat any. Uh, the first, I believe, will be from Ms. Kerrigan. Uh, Mr. Constantine often uh, discusses the uh, model, um, and I'm wondering if Ms. Kerrigan could just chat about when Kern County, based on the model, uh, is supposed to see a peak in hospitalization. The only, the only other question I have is for uh, Mr. Judd. I know he was talking about previous Decembers, or uh, previous years, that is. I do not expect that he has exact numbers in front of him, but, but um, one more time, how does ICU capacity right now at this time compare to, to other years in his uh, view? Thank you so much. Okay, so we have one question for Russell about ICU capacity this year versus last year or years before, uh, and then a question for uh, Bryn about the model and when we reach, uh, based on the model, when we reach peak uh, on cases. Is that correct? Excellent. That's correct. Thank okay. you so much. We'll have Bryn start. Good morning. The models actually haven't changed. They haven't been updated. They still show one large surge with a peak, I believe, in early February of us um, peaking out and then dropping back off. And we have been watching hospital capacity and aligning it with that model to see when that one surge that's demonstrated on that model would exceed hospital capacity. We unfortunately, our actual cases and our actual hospitalizations didn't follow along with that clean model of one nice surge. So we just continue to watch where our cases seem to be headed and where our hospital capacity lies and make sure that we're always planning for the event that we should um, or possibly exceed that capacity and what we would do in that circumstance. Thank you. As far as ICU capacity today compared to historical averages, uh, it is very similar to what we run in the past. As I mentioned at Kern Medical, uh, today we're full uh, in our ICUs. Uh, I would say, it's hard to give a specific number, but 20 to 30 percent of the time over any years we're hit that full mark. Uh, that's just the fluctuation that happens in healthcare. Uh, the other ICUs, uh, well, I can't speak to their specific numbers today in my conversations and as we gather together, they will report the, the, the same. Your ICU could be completely full today and you have a couple of discharges and you have no patients presenting and it goes back down to capacity. So today uh, matches very historical averages of ICU capacity. Again, we're uh, concerned about the future and cannot reemphasize enough People can protect themselves and avoid hospitalizations. Thank you very much. KUCC, Rob, did you have any follow-up questions? Channel 23, Austin, any follow-up questions? Yeah, hi there. Our, our, um, following up on our uh, contact tracing data, I, I know that our data is showing that businesses are not the most significant spreader of the virus locally, but I'm still curious, what risk are people and businesses taking if they choose to ignore the state's order and, and continue to do things like dining at restaurants or, or going to the gym or, or going to a house of worship, et cetera? 
I know those businesses that are impacted by the state are not the most significant sources of spread again, but still, how significant are those businesses to our community spread and what kind of risk are people taking by ignoring those orders? Are they taking a big risk or would you guys call it a, a lower risk perhaps? Awesome, we're gonna have Bryn respond. Good morning, you're, you're correct in saying that a majority of our transmissions are from close contacts and most of those close contact transmissions are coming from within an individual's household. Um, it's very difficult to say that if somebody comes down with COVID-19 and they don't know who that an initial source was that they actually got it at a specific business or restaurant or where they actually got it if they don't know somebody that was actually positive that they had close contact with. So tracking that back to where that initial infection came from becomes very difficult to pinpoint. Um, Early on, the state released, when they released their safer, their blueprint for a safer economy, they released a lot of industry guidance that outlined what industry should be doing in order to have the lowest risk for transmission within those industries. Subsequently, we entered into this regional stay-at-home order with the state indicating that, you know, these businesses shouldn't even operate in accordance to those guidelines that were supposedly a safe way for these businesses to operate. Um, I would say that the safest way for those businesses to operate is to follow those guidelines that were established for the lowest risk of transmission um, within those business industries. And a, a final follow-up. Uh, we, we know that uh, not all of our uh, um, nurses, and, and we know this first round of, of vaccines are, are going to go to only a specific portion of people, but it's not going to cover all of those that are um, on the front line of this virus. How are we deciding which frontline workers are going to be getting the vaccine and which ones are not? Thanks, Austin. I think Kim covered that briefly before, but we'll have her hit it one more time. Give us one second. Thanks. Hi, Austin, thank you. Uh, we continue to work with our community to identify the people who are at highest risk um, of exposure to COVID. Um, you know, phase 1A of the federal vaccination plan includes healthcare workers. Um, we have, you know, thousands of healthcare workers in our community. We don't expect that we will have all enough vaccine um, immediately available for all of them. So the state has made uh, sub priority groups within uh, phase 1A. So within those healthcare providers, they have prioritized healthcare providers at highest risk. Um, when we talk about any facility, there are certain people who work for the healthcare organization that are at higher risk than others um, of coming into contact with people who may have COVID and being exposed. So with, within each of these organizations that we are working with to vaccinate their staff, we are asking them to identify the highest risk people and to start with those people. We do expect that vaccine will become more available as time goes on. Um, in the federal playbook, you can see it described that there will be a limited supply in December and throughout the beginning of 2021, um, that supply will increase. And so as the supply increase, we will be getting more uh, vaccine out into our community and be able to um, increase the number of people who are getting vaccinated. Um, once there is sufficient um, supply out in our healthcare community, it will continue to expand to other priority populations. Um, and so this is something that has, you know, both at the federal level, the state level, and here at the local level, a lot of thought has been put into trying to reach the people and protect the people at highest risk um, of being infected with COVID, of coming into, pa into contact with patients who have COVID, to get them protected first and foremost, and then continuing to get um, all of the rest of the healthcare organization protected, and then moving on to the next populations. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, guys. That's for me. Valley Public Radio, Carrie, did you have any follow-up questions? Yes, I did. Um, I was wondering, back in it was either August or September, there were a couple of fitness centers, some gyms that were allowed to open with um, their their normal capacities or um, I guess unlimited you know unlimited capacity from what they were before, despite being in the purple or the red tier. Uh, that was, uh, you know, Sculpt 65 and some kind of fitness gyms. I was wondering if they still have that status now, um, if they're still allowed to be open and if they're, if they're actually con still considered essential businesses or not. No, they are closed down currently. Sorry, we were getting information. So they are currently closed down with the um, regional stay-at-home order. 
Okay, thanks. Uh -huh. Okay, with that, we've made it through all of our questions. I want to thank you all for joining, uh, and we will see you next time.